I can't see. Okay, here we go. Amen. We do thank God tonight for his goodness, his mercy, his grace. We thank God for the spirit, the Holy Spirit. We thank God for his son, Jesus Christ, who shed his blood on Calvary for our, our deliverance, our healing, everything that we would need to be successful in our walk with him. Christ has provided through his son. And we thank God for the love of God. We thank God for another day that we are here today. We uh, woke up this morning and, and it was Jesus and the Lord, the spirit of God that woke us up this morning. And we thank God and we work today. Some of us work today. If you had to, you went to work or you work from home, we just thank God for all that he's done, all that he's doing. And we are, we are so thankful for tonight. Amen. I do. And we do give honor to Bishop Harper, our illustrious pastor, who is traveling, who is in Memphis at this very moment at spring call. We thank God for he and Mother uh, Mother Harper. Uh, we thank God for the first family. And we pray for them. We we plead the blood of Jesus upon their lives. We thank I give honor to my wife, District Missionary Edmonds, all of the missionaries, all the mothers, all the deacons, all the ministers. Saints and friends, and I think I said the elders, but I give honor to all the elders, everyone that's on the line tonight. In whatever capacity you are serving, I give honor to those whose honor is due. We thank God. If there are any children that may be listening or any of our young people tonight, we give we thank God for them. And we thank God for, again, just another opportunity to uh, come together for a Bible study to learn more about him and to learn more about what it takes and what he's requiring of us to be witnesses for him in the earth. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and pray. Dear Father, we thank you. We worship you. Lord, we give your name, honor, and praise God for all that you've done, all that you'll do, Lord. We thank you, Lord, just for another day, just another day that you have kept us, Father. We thank you, Lord, for this week, God. We thank you, Lord, for this month, God. We thank you for this year, God. We thank you for food and raiment, Father. We thank you for homes and jobs, God. We thank you, God, for all that you have done and all that you will do, God. So I plead the blood of Jesus over everyone's on the line, over our Kelly Lake Cathedral family, over our bishop, our pastor, our first family, over the body of Christ, over Christendom, God. I plead the blood of Jesus over your people, God, tonight, Lord, that you would continue to guide us and lead us and bless us, God, every day, God, new mercies every day, God, and we thank you for your mercy, God. We thank you for, uh, Lord, the opportunity, God, to serve. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you have done, Lord. You're so wonderful, God. You're so good. You're so gracious. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord. We love you, Father. We thank you, God, for all that you've done. So bless tonight, God. We pray for our speaker tonight, God. We ask you to we do it. Uh, speak to his heart, his mind, Father. You know, keep him focused, Lord. Help him to uh, give us the bread of life, God, that you, you have given him, Father. And we thank you for all that you have done, Lord. All that you have done, Lord. All that you have done, Lord. Lord, we praise your holy, matchless name. We give you honor, Lord. You're so good. You're so wonderful. Hallelujah to your name. And I thank you tonight, God. I ask that you would again, Lord, just look on us, bless us, keep us. And all these blessings we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read our scripture tonight. Uh, uh, it will be Proverbs, the 22nd chapter. And uh, it's just one verse. And it says, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. A good name, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches 
and a loving and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Amen. I think that ministers to a lot of different areas. I won't go into it, but we just thank God tonight for his love, as I said earlier. Amen. Uh, are there any testimonies tonight? Anyone have a testimony of God's goodness and grace and mercy? Amen. Amen. If not, we'll move on. We thank God again tonight. Uh, we know the bishop is traveling. I don't I don't see him on. Uh, maybe he'll join us later, but please keep he and mother and the first family and everyone in prayer. But please, especially our bishop, our pastor, and that we would uh, give, he would have travel in mercy. He and mother, if she's with him, will have travel in mercies and that the blood of Jesus would cover and that they would get the business of the church taken care of. Amen. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and move on in the strength of the Lord. Tonight, our speaker is Elder Lloyd Powell. Uh, of course, everybody uh, that's been at the church know who Elder Paul is. Great, great man of God, great speaker, very meticulous in the word of God, uh, a great elder. And we thank God for he and his wife. And uh, we thank God for all that they've done and all that God is doing. I give honor to my wife. I think I did. But let me just say it again. I do give honor to Sister Joyce as she travels. And we thank God again tonight for all that he's done. Elder Powell, we're praying for you, sir. Uh, the floor is yours, and uh, let the Lord use you, sir. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, Elder Harrington. Certainly, I give an honor to our pastor, Bishop Harper, and to First Lady Harper, and to give an honor to my wife on today and on this evening, and to all, all of you guys' people. Um, we're going to uh, go to the book of Ephesians on tonight. Uh, Prayers already been prayed, but let me just just pray another prayer for I, before we go to the scripture. Lord, I ask you that you let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Let's see if I can get the PowerPoint up. Um, Share screen. All right, can you all see that? Elder Harrington, where is it? Yeah, to your right there. Yeah, you're on it right That's there. It? Yeah, put it in presentation mode. Okay. All right. Hey Amen. We're gonna <clears throat> we're gonna be looking at the book of Ephesians on tonight. Um Book of Ephesians, uh, Paul, where well, the main theme of the book is unity in Christ. Uh, it's talking about our oneness or our unity um, in Christ. And the, um, the church of Ephesians was started by Paul the apostle. Paul had, um, Paul was in Corinth. You can see Corinth over here to the, to the far right where it says Achaia. Uh, that was the providence, and Corinth was right in the providence of Achaia, all the way to the far right over here. So he left the church at Corinth, and he sailed over here to Ephesus. And he 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 took Priscilla and Aquila with him. Um, and he wasn't he wasn't at the church at Ephesus too long. He was there maybe maybe two months before he left going to Jerusalem. Uh, he told them that I have to keep this feast in Jerusalem, but I will return. And so he left Priscilla and Aquila there to carry on the work. And so um, he sailed by ship, he sailed by ship from Ephesus. You see that red line? He went all the way south to uh, Caesarea and Caesarea is about 70, miles north of Jerusalem, and he attended the feast. Does, the Bible does not tell us what feast he attended, um, but he, um, he wanted to make sure that he was in Jerusalem for the feast. 
And so he stayed there a while. And then, you know, travel is not like it is now. From Ephesus, over here in Ephesus, to Jerusalem was about 600 miles. And uh, ships, I think they, from what I understand, you, you might get about, you might average about 25 miles per day. So it took him anywhere from 21 to 30 days to get to, to sail to Jerusalem. And so he went to the feast. And he left Jerusalem and went up here to his home church, which is the church at Antioch. Just like you belong to Kelly Lake, Kelly Lake, uh, he was a member of the church at Antioch, which is uh, uh, north of, of Jerusalem. And so it took Paul about maybe about a year to get back to Ephesus. And when he got back, uh, what Priscilla and Aquila carry on the work while he was gone. And when he got back to Ephesus, yes. He um he uh, stayed there about two years, and so this church um, it was pretty well established uh, during the uh, you know the two years that Paul was there, and so he left the church and um, started his third missionary journey, and about six years later he penned uh, this letter to the church at Ephesus. I think he was. Uh, he was in jail when he when he penned this letter. Uh, some six, maybe seven years later. Um, anybody know anything about about Ephesus, city of Ephesus? It's worship, and it's. Uh, does anybody know anything about the about the city? Okay, so the city at Ephesus was known for. Uh, the worship of the goddess Diana. Um, is Diana in the King James, is Artemis in other translations. And the temple there was considered one of the seven wonders of, of the world. And so this city was a metropolitan city. Uh, it was on it was on it was on the water, on the waterfront. It was on it was a metropolitan city because you had people coming in and out from all over the world. And they came to see this, this great temple of the goddess Diana. And many people uh, throughout the world worshiped uh, the goddess Diana. And in addition to worshiping Diana, you had maybe 50 other gods and goddesses that they, uh, that they worshiped. And so the makeup of the people here was, were Jews and Gentiles. And the Gentiles came from all over the world. It was sort of like Atlanta, it was a metropolitan city, you know, and uh, people came from all over the place. So half the people there were probably not from there, they were from other places. And so um, all of these people, they, they were there with their different cultures and their different nationalities and their different religions. And it was just a hodgepodge of different religions, different nationalities and uh, different cultures. And so these are the people that made up the uh, church at Ephesus. They were from many different different places and had many different ideals and so forth. And so Paul is writing to this church with all these differences, um, and especially society, the um, you know um, the Greek and Roman society. I don't think the Greeks. I don't think the the, the Greeks appreciated the Romans because the Romans overthrew the Greeks. Um, they put them out of power. And so there was no love lost between Greeks and Romans. And so um, you just had all just a whole stuff going on here culturally in this particular church. Um, Ephesus 19, it says, moreover, you see in here that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia um, has perspective persuaded and turned away many people saying that there are no gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disaster, but the great temple, but the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed whom all Asia and the world worship. And so these, um, these silversmiths which made, um, which made idols for Diana 
had a problem with Paul because Paul was preaching that there were no gods made with hands. And so uh, this gospel had been preached through all out Asia and they were sort of, uh, they were causing Paul some problems. Okay, so the book of Ephesus is, is broken up into two sections. It has six chapters, chapters one through three are mainly doctrine, the doctrinal sections. And they tell basically what God has done for, for us, or what God has done for you. And then the practical section, verses four through six, tell um, how we should respond, what our response should be um, in relation to what God has done for us. And as I said, the main theme of the book is unity in Christ, unity or oneness in Christ. And we'll look at some of the main, main words uh, and the uh, key words in the book of, uh, of Ephesians. Um, one of the key words is the word one. One is used from 20 times in 15 different verses. Uh, four and four said there is one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. Uh, four and five says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One in 10 says uh, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. Two and four says, for he is our peace who have made both one, meaning Jews and Gentiles, and have broken down the middle wall of petition um, between us. And so one, one is all over the book. He's trying to show that how we are one in Christ. We are one we are one uh, body with him. Uh, the word unity is also used, is used twice. Uh, four and three says, endeavor to keep, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. 4.13 says, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the son of God unto a perfect man. Um, I think it says, um, I got something in the way here, but it says into the full stature of the fullness of Christ. And so the word one and unity. And so he tastes, he, um, he uses that word one. And he tells how that, uh, uh, he says that the relationship between a man and a woman, how a man and a woman uh, become one flesh. Uh, but he says what I speak concerning Christ in the church. He uses that analogy to tell how we have become one spirit with Christ. And so we are united with Christ in spirit. Your spirit and Christ's spirit are united. We're, that's what we call the body of Christ because we have become one with him. And then you see here the word Christ. Christ is used some 45 times. Um, and then... Um, the pronoun him referring to Christ is used some 20 times. And you see words in here like in him, in whom, in Christ. And so uh, Christ and then the church is used. So he's trying to tell, is, is, the book is full of Christology. So he's trying to tell us about Christ and his church. The book is about the unity between Christ and his church. Christ and his church are one. There's a unity. They are united. There's a unity between Christ and the church. Uh, church is used some nine times and body is also used, uh, referring to the church. And also the word mystery is used uh, some six times. Um, in 3.9, he says, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which is the beginning, uh, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God. And then this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. All right, so we're going to look at the first chapter of the book of Ephesians. Um, and this is this is sort of an, this is an outline of, of the book uh, of the first chapter. And um, if you go back after this, if you go back and study it. This is a basic outline of the first chapter. And you can see how the verses are broken down. If you, if you read scripture, um, it's all broken down 
into paragraphs. So if you can find the paragraph divisions in a particular chapter, it helps you to understand what the, uh, what the author is trying to say and what he's trying to communicate. So this is the breakdown of the paragraph divisions in Ephesians. Uh, verses one and two is his greeting and verses three through 14, he talks about spiritual blessings in Christ. And that's what we're going to look at, the spiritual blessings that he enumerates that we have in Christ. And also um, in the first chapter, he talks about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And we see that how he shows here in these verses how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit work together in unity. So we're one, we're united with Christ, but also the, the Godhead, there's unity in the Godhead, and they work together uh, in unity. Okay. All right. So we'll start. Um, we'll start in chapter one. Um, all right. I just want to see, can I move the, uh, All right, now let's look at chapter one. These are the, uh... all right, kind of get someone to read, starting at chapter one, I mean, yeah, starting at verse one. Read what's on the screen? Yeah, read what's on the screen, Ephesians uh, 1, 1, and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints, which which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. So uh, Paul is addressing the church at Ephesus, and he says, um, he says, uh, he said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and he's addressing the saints, which are at Ephesus. He says that, that they are faithful. So he calls them saints and he calls them faithful. Uh, why do you think he uses the term saints when he refers to, um, to the church, to the people at the church at Ephesus? What is significant about that word saints? Why does he call them that? Anybody? <laughs> Yeah. This is real. It's old. Is it? So why do you think why do you think he calls them saints? What would be the uh because the word saints, the word saints is also it has to, it kind of has like when you know there, there are plenty of references to the old covenant. And this is probably one of those where in the temple, um, the word is also the word hagias, and it is um, used, it also is translated holy. And it kind of makes a reference to the, the utensils, the vessels that are in the temple, and they are called holy. And so he makes a reference. Uh, Elder Harrington, you see your hand up? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I when you were asking that question, I, I also, it, I have a Bible that says in the notes, says to the holy ones and to the faithful. So he's addressing a certain group of people uh, when he says to the saints. So he's he's addressing a certain, it's not a, this is not a general letter to everyone. He's talking to the saints, the holy ones, and those who are naming the name of Christ at uh, in the at the church of Ephesus. Yes. So, yes, he's writing to a specific group of people. Uh, he's writing to the saints and to the faithful. And so these are people who have faith in Jesus Christ. And because of their faith, remember, we're talking about Ephesians. It's, it's, um, it's talking about unity in Christ. So he's telling them that you are in Christ. That's his emphasis. You are in Christ. You are united with Christ. And so he says the faithful 
in Christ. There's that phrase, Christ in Christ, in Christ Jesus. And so they have placed faith in Christ and they are, um, and they are faithful to him. They're trustworthy because, and they're saints because they have placed faith in Jesus Christ. And it says, grace be unto you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And also I just, the, the picture I have here that when you come to Christ, you put on Christ. That, um, see my little man at the top, the illuminated man, your spirit changes. He, he changes you when you come to Christ. And so uh, Paul is trying to get the church to see how God looks at them. He doesn't see you as being that old person that you were, but he sees you as being a new person, a saint, because you are in Christ. When you are in Christ, God looks at you differently. He sees you differently than, you, than when you were in the world. You are a saint. You belong to him. And the uh, saint, to talk about holy, there's also a word in the Old Testament that was used for the vessels in the, in the church, and in, in the temple. And they were specifically set aside or designated for God's use. They were holy. They were sanctified. They were set apart for God's use. And so when you get saved, your spirit is designated and set apart for God's use. Your spirit belongs to God. It's set aside for his use, just like the vessels in the temple were set aside or holy, set aside for his use. All right. Um, so we need to begin to see ourselves differently, see ourselves as, as Christ, as God sees us. He sees us as being holy because we are in Christ. That's our position in Christ. Any comments? Any comments, any observations? Well, Elder Powell, I, I also noticed, is that a Harrington again? I, hopefully I didn't jump over anybody. But the word grace is mentioned 12 times. Um, I don't know. I, I think you said something about that. And if I'm repeating it, uh, uh, please forgive me. But 12 times he talks about the grace that he has extended to uh, the church, uh, the, the, the Ephesian church. And, and, and of course, if that grace is extended to them, quite naturally, God has extended grace to us, an abundance of grace. And who doesn't need grace? Uh, I think about uh, 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 Bishop Jakes would say the, the wonder twins, grace and mercy. So I think that, you know, uh, that that mercy is a byproduct of grace and everything. And, we, and who doesn't need grace? Who doesn't need grace? Uh, uh, as uh, if you're playing golf, uh, a mulligan or uh, who doesn't need the ability to have God to get, hey, you know, uh, I got this, I'm doing this, but Lord, give me the grace, give me your grace uh, in this situation and give me the grace to do, give me the grace to be what you're calling me to be, to be in the ministry that you're calling me, give me the grace. All right, I don't want to go any further. Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> grace is a very important part of being in Christ. Uh, and as you see, as we go into the lesson, you see how God is rich in grace and he's rich in mercy. And he's extravagant with his grace and extravagant uh, with his mercy. Um, okay. Um, okay, so in verses one and two he, is, is Paul's greeting. And so Paul begins to, starting at verse Verses three, um, um, three and four, he begins to enumerate the blessings that God has bestowed upon those who are in Christ. Uh, can I just want to read read those verses for me? Um, Harriet Woodard, reading. Okay. Blessed be the God and Father of our Father Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we were, that we would be holy and without blame before him in love. All right. Hold it down a minute. Uh, in the third verse, he said, blessed be the God and father of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ. So he says, God be blessed. All right, and then he said, blessed be the God 
who have blessed us. So we bless God, the word. So how do we bless God? How do we bless him? You know, uh, how do you bless somebody who has everything? So what? Are, how do we bless God? Answer the question. By, pra by praising him and living um, according to his precepts. Yes. So that word there means to, to eulogize. It means to speak well of. And like you said, to praise. You know, we praise him and we, we bless him because he has blessed us. Uh, it says, blessed be the God and Father, Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. All right. Um, go ahead. Go ahead, Sister Word. Finish reading that. Okay, having predestinated us unto the adoption of the children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to be praised of the glory and his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved. Okay, so he's, he goes, oh. all right, that's good. Okay. All right, so I have here just, so the blessings that he blessed us with, um, he blessed, he says, he chose us, chose, we're chosen to him, we were chosen to him before the foundation of the world um, to be holy and without blame before him in love. He predestinated us to the adoption of, of his son or his children, and he made us accepted, acceptable, accepted in the beloved, meaning in his beloved son. So these are the spiritual blessings that he has blessed us with, that they are spiritual blessings meaning that they're not physical blessings, um, uh, but they're spiritual blessings. They are, they're, they, are, they are blessings that are not physical per se, but they're blessings that are uh, and, and they're in the heavenly places. So they are in a place where people can't break through and steal, and they're eternal if they are spiritual blessings. Um, so it says, that we have been chosen in him before the foundation of the world. What do you think that means? We're chosen in him. He chose us before the foundation of the world. Now this is in Christ. Um, according as he has chosen us in him. That's the word in him. Remember, in him in whom is talking about Christ. So in Christ, he chose us before the foundation of the world. Now, what does that mean? Did he know us before we were born? I can't I can't see hands. Can, can someone someone want to elaborate on that? Chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Someone want to elaborate on that? Well, this is Elder Mormon. Uh, <clears throat> um, I am really intrigued by these verses that you're talking about. And I'll get to just to what you're saying. Uh, chosen in chosen us in him before the foundation of the world in conjunction, that's verse four, in conjunction with verse three. Um, and maybe I'll put it together, and all you've put all of this together. This is quite, uh, as I'm thinking about it, quite a, a, a declaration here. Um, first of all, we have Jesus Christ, who was, was born of the Virgin Mary and... <clears throat> There was, uh, you know, there was there was not this widespread understanding as we have it that Jesus Christ was actually born of the of of the of the Spirit of God, and uh, for uh, Paul to uh, make this declaration that he is um, uh, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ is quite a declaration at that at, at that point, um, recognizing the power and the splendor, the glory of Jesus uh, of the of God mm -hmm. in Jesus Christ, and then it goes into um, I, I guess I could say it like uh, um, uh, a a, um, a uh, reaching back into the uh, timeless past, so to speak, um, um, in, in, in when it refers to the foundation of the world, 
uh, you think about uh, the first chapter, first verse of Genesis, where it says, in the beginning, God. Uh, mm -hmm. And we see that God is even before the beginning. So God is before time was, and God is like outside of time. And for, um, for us to be chosen in him before the world was, before the foundation of the world, um, is 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 quite a declaration in and of itself right there. Uh, so I'm I'm just um, thinking about this, and it's like uh, powerful stuff to 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 be declared. Um, uh, um, uh, to be well, yeah, to be declared that um, we were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world, meaning God knew us before there was uh, us, before there was our parents, for parents, anything, uh, even going back to before the foundation of the world. This is the plan of God, and uh, it's all in him. In him is the key term I see. I see. Yeah. Um, so so you're, saying, you're saying Paul is saying God knew you? Before the foundation of the world, he knew you before you were even created, before you were even born. I mean, all the way back eons ago, he knew you. Uh, I, I go stronger than that. He not only knew <laughs> us, he chose us. He chose us. <laughs> wow. In I mean, him. Chose us in him. Yeah. yeah. So he didn't wow. just know us. It wasn't like this was just, okay, yeah, I know him. No, 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 no. Jesus uh, um, uh, God has uh, 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 destined, put a destination in place before anything started. Yeah, so it, it, it's it's amazing. I so, could, yeah. so when you when you talk about it, also said that He predestinated us to the adoption of children. Predestined. Uh, what does that mean? So He chose us before the foundation of the world. And he predestinated us to be yeah. adopted as his children. What does that mean? He predestinated us. What uh, is that? What is that about? I, I, I'll let somebody else talk. I, I promise. But I, I, it's, I'm even... I a little try. I was, as Elder Mormon was talking, I was thinking about the conversation that God and Jesus must have had before the foundation of the world. Not only is he going to create us and blow his breath in us, he's going to give us free will to choose him, although he's already chosen us, free will to become sons and daughters of his if we so desire by accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Just imagine that. He's going to give you the will to accept him, if you reject him and later on you come to him, he still have that redemption plan for, for you. So his whole idea in the beginning is to have us to dwell with him for all eternity because pastor was preaching on Sunday about the disturbance in heaven. God always wanted to be worshiped. So the creation on earth was to worship him. We were created to worship him. I hope I'm making sense. Mm -hmm. And and. You know, man sinned, but Jesus paid the ultimate price so that we can be redeemed back to him. So he pre he he had it all mapped out. Now, um, so we're talking about predestination. So does he choose some to be saved and some he to be lost? All would be saved, but we have free will. He's not going to, we aren't robots. He made us in his image. He we have the free will to choose him as our Lord and Savior or reject him. All right. So she says that he chose all to be saved, uh, but some reject them. Anybody disagree with that at a moment? Well, I tell you, <laughs> uh, now you're getting into some real doctrinal um, uh, wranglings here. Um, um, th there, there, there is this um, statement here, which clearly says that God has chosen us. Uh, in him before the foundation of the world, and then uh -huh. it's, it's predestined, which mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, we say that God is the Alpha and Omega, so it's like 
he determined the end from the beginning and even before the beginning, as I said, for, before the foundation of the world. So we have this, we have this um, dichotomy of the of the sovereignty of God, yet the the accountability of man. How can God be sovereign yet man accountable? Is the is 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 the uh, doctrinal theme here? Because here it says clearly. Um, you know, it's a done deal. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's really what it's saying. It's, 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 he's chosen. He's chosen us before and, the foundation of the world. And, and predestined. He, <laughs> and he predestined us yes. before the foundation of the world. Now, this would not make sense to the, to the, I mean, to, to us and our finite understanding, but that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's because we are, are finite. How mm -hmm. can, how can it be determined already? And you would lead that, that would lead into a, a, a thought of uh, um, what is it called? Uh, the doctrine of, of, of election or. Uh, yeah, doctrine uh, of election. I, that, that, yeah, uh, we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, Deacon John and Missionary Mary Sanders. Saunders, I seen you. Yes, my uh, hand was up, but I tell you. Elder Moment hit it right on the head because I was thinking the same thing. God is Alpha, the beginning. So his plan, as also Elder Moment hit on, that is God's plan. He had the blueprint from the beginning of what he wanted. He knew how, where, who, what, he wanted each of his children to be. So yep. it was no, uh, to us as humans, we don't have the foresight yep. to be able to have that particular uh, uh, vision. But God being God and supreme in his way, he had the blueprint before it was created to yep. know exactly what he wanted to put in place. So God being God, nothing is outside of his cycle. That's Thank kind you. of mind blowing to me. If yeah. God, so so is, is, is the way predestined or is the individual predestined? So if you, I use this example, if you get on I-20 going west, if you take it, all the way to the end, where are you gonna end up? <laughs> Anybody uh, took I twenty to the end? Uh, Dallas, uh, Texas. You uh, end up in Birmingham, I twenty. If you, oh, it, you all the way. Oh no, go that. Hey, but, but you go a whole lot further than Birmingham. It goes farther than that. Well, if you, you take I twenty, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't go to California now. I know that. It goes to twenty 25. goes to forty, uh, and yeah. then it will go. Yeah, but, 20, yeah, 20, right. But my That's point right. is, you end up at the destination, right? Yeah. Right. You, you end up at the destination. If you take 20 going east, I mean, yeah, going east, where you end up? Around Augusta, somewhere in there? Yeah, oh, Carolina. Other than that, you go to... No, don't go, I thought it ended at, at the... Columbia. Columbia. You gonna end up in the water. You end up, yeah. You end up at Myrtle Beach. Yeah, you end up somewhere, now, yeah. But what I'm saying, it has a destination. Yeah. They designed it the way if you take it, you're going to end up at this destination if you take it all the way. And if you end up at that, that, you know, take the other way, you end up. So what I'm saying, if you're in Christ, you're going to end up in the destination. You're going to end up in heaven. If you're not in Christ, you're on the wrong road, you're going to end up at that place where it's hot. It's going to be a little warm at that place. So is it the, is it, is it the the way that is predestined, or is it the individual that's predestined, or is it both that are predestined? In other words, it depends on what road you're on. That depends on your predestination. What are your thoughts? <laughs> you know, I, 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 I'm I'm okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay quiet on that one. Okay. So so if you're in Christ, if you're in Christ. You're well, predestined. I say a lot about it now, but I ain't going to. Yeah. So, so, so if you're in Christ, where you going to end up? If you're in Christ 
and you die, where are you going to end up? Yeah. If you're not in Christ and you die, where do you end up? Yeah. So not only, so the way is predestined for sure. I can say that for sure, that the way is predestined. But this says he chosen us in him before the foundation. So as Sister Wood was saying, so does God know those who are going to chose him? And does God know those who are going to reject him? He know whether you're going to reject him or not. Brother Powell? Yeah. May I ask a question? Uh, 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 my question would be in, in, the, in this pericope of scripture to exegete what having predestined that fifth verse, is, is this situational? Is this having predestined, is he talking to a certain situation uh, with the Ephesian church? He's, is this is this for them? Since it's in Ephesian and this is a letter that yeah. Paul has written to the Ephesian, is this situational? So he's talking to the church at Ephesus and said, mm -hmm. God has predestined us, you, unto adoption of children. Now you understand that adoption part comes in because mm -hmm. the Ephesus, uh, those people are there, their nation, their nationality. They are, they're not Jews, they're Gentiles. Right. When he talks, starts talking about predestined us unto adoption, I predestine you. So I'd be predestined to adopt you into the body of Christ. You're not Jews, you're Gentiles, but I have predestined for you to be adopted as children unto me. Yes. Because that's the reason, you know. So he sent Paul to the Gentile church. Paul mm -hmm. is known as the, the bishop of the Gentile church. he So when we're looking at this, we may be making it, and you help me out, it may be, we might be broadening it, broadening it too much because this is situational. Because when you get into predestination, then we're getting into Calvinism. And then that's a whole nother genre. In uh, Romans uh, 8, 29 through 37, it talks about whom uh, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Mm -hmm. So it, we're getting, uh, I won't say we're getting, but it's, it's, it, it kind of takes the, the, the subject matter to, uh, another matter, which is Calvinism. But I think that this part right here, this predestined is, uh, situational to the, uh, uh, people at Ephesus because they were not Jews. They were Gentiles. Yeah, and Paul is apostle to the Gentiles. So it would apply not only to the Gentiles there, but Gentiles everywhere that God has predestined us. So if you're in Christ, you're predestined. God, I, I, I agree with Sister Wood. God knows who will come to him, and he knows those who will not come to him, those who reject him. Uh, Paul said he's not willing that, uh, I think Peter said he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So um, while, they, while if you're in Christ, while you are predestined, God is not willing that anyone should perish. And I think in Revelations, it's talking about how some names were blotted out of the book of life. You know, so um, um, back, in, back in ancient days, they didn't have erasers, so they get your name, they would just blot it out. And it said in Revelation, some names would be blot, blotted out. So I think God knows those who were, um, uh, salvation is open to everybody, but everybody uh, will not accept. If you even look at Cain and Abel, Cain rejected God. He, God told Cain, Cain, I'm give you, you know, I'm paraphrasing, I'm gonna give you another chance. If you don't take it, sin lies at the door. Go, go and offer uh, uh, the sacrifice that I ask you. And he was so stubborn and rebellion that uh, he rebelled against God. God gave him another chance. And so there are those who will accept Christ uh, by faith and those who are not, those who will reject Christ. And so if you're in Christ, you're predestined. If you're not in Christ, you're predestined. So it would behoove us uh, to choose Christ. Uh, and because uh, both ways are predestined. Any more thoughts on that? All right. And it says he just he says he chose us to him before the foundation of the world to be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, what is that about? What is that? What is that about? He chose us, but he chose us to be holy and without blame before him in love. And what is that holy and without blame about? 
um, here that he's talking about. All right, remember he's choosing us in Christ. So in Christ, we're holy and without blame. Uh, it's like we were talking about earlier about the um, um, uh, about the 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 sac the, um, uh, the vessels at the temple. If somebody had a hand up, I can't. I think you said word it again. I'm not good at putting my hand up. Just thinking about. Christ being that ultimate pure sacrifice for us and if we really do have on that new man then we can be holy and blameless before God. Yeah, it's a standing but you know it has nothing to do with your conduct it has to do with your position in him because if you're in Christ you're holy and without blame. Now it goes to our conduct. In other words he makes you holy um, I use the term you know um, if you go get a job, they give you a position. You, they, I mean, you're, you're, um, you know, a young lady told me she, they made her uh, a dialysis technician. They had on her badge, dialysis technician. She didn't know anything about being a dialysis technician, but she shadowed somebody. She followed somebody, you know, who was a dialysis technician. And then uh, she became in practice what they had made her a position. Her bad said that she was a dialysis technician and she that's what they told her she was. That was they hired her at. That was her position. And so she became in practice what they made her in position. So God has positioned you as being one who is holy and without blame. Now he tells you to walk in the spirit so you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Learn how to obey your spirit. Learn how to walk after your spirit. And you will be, you, in other words, you will become in practice what I have made you in position. It's the sanctification process. Um, and he tells you how to do that some more when he gets into the, to, to the second part, the practical aspects of it. But we are holy and we are with blame, uh, blame before him in love. And so we have to learn, we have to learn how to walk this thing out. Yes, and that's yes. why we come to Bible study. That's why we uh, come to yes. Sunday school so that we can learn how to that's why we come to morning worship. That's why we take notes on Sunday morning so we can learn how to be holy in our conduct and holy in our conversation. Uh, anybody else before we move on to our next set of verses? All right. So he, before we, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Why? To be holy and without blame before him in love. It says he predestinated us to be adopted as his children. Uh, to be his sons and to be his daughters. And he accepted us in the beloved. He made us acceptable in Christ Jesus. And then it says in verse six, why did he do it? Why did he do all this for us? It said to the praise of the glory of his grace, because he wants you to praise him. All right, that's why he did it. It says for the praise of the glory is his grace. Uh, no, it says in the fifth verse, according to the good pleasure of his will. So why did he do this for because he wanted to. He just wanted to. Now, your will is your want to. So he he, he wanted to. Yeah, we talked about how God is rich in grace. He's so rich in grace and mercy. He just wanted to do this for us. And then it says to the praise of the glory of his grace. So he did it because he wanted to. And he did it because he wants you to praise him for what he has done. Uh, Sister Kimbrough. So oh, I was just trying to answer the uh, the last question that that you had that I had looked up. Um, you want me to still answer that? All right. Well, I just looked up where it says question? like blameless. It said those who cannot be accused of wrongdoing, and then it said the example where David had asked God um, to deliver him from you know willful sinning. Mm -hmm. So that's why I got from that holy without blame. Yeah, yeah. So we're yeah we're holy. And without blame, uh, as far as our position, but we have to work it, walk it out, to be to become holy in our practice. So we be we're becoming. It's not about doing; it's about being. So, and that's why we you have to learn three disciplines. You have to learn the discipline of fasting, and uh, discipline of prayer, and the discipline of uh, 
uh, renewing your mind with God's word. Um, and as, as you do those things, you begin to see your, your, your inner man, your spirit man, begin to come forth. Um, and to, um, you know, if, if you're in the flesh, if you're not, if you're not fasting, not praying and disciplining your body, then your flesh will control you. But if you crucify your flesh, Paul said, I die daily. Paul said, stuff I'm going through, I have to die daily. I'm doing something daily to kill my flesh. Uh, and the scripture tells us, though, uh, if you come after me, any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. So what does it take for you to crucify your flesh, to bring your flesh under subjection so that your spirit might be manifest, that your spirit might lead you and your spirit might guide you rather than your flesh? All right. We're going to go on to the, to the next set of the verses. Um, all right. Okay, can someone read that for us? He, 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 so he's talking about our spiritual blessings in Christ. Because we are in Christ, because we have been united with him. He says, this is a, 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 a husband and wife are one and, 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 and become one flesh. You have become one spirit with Christ. Your spirit is united with him. And because you're in Christ, he's given us all these blessings. Um, and then he enumerates three more here in these passages. Can someone read that, that for us? In whom we have redemption. Go ahead, Sister Kimber. You, you In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Ephesians 1, 5 through 8, the King James Version. Go ahead. Go read the rest of them. Okay, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he had purpose in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Ephesians okay. 1 through 9 through 10. All right. So it says, in whom, remember, in whom, in him. So it's talking about Christ. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now, what is redemption? What is that about? What is he talking about? Redemption. We have redemption through his blood. What is that? What does the word redemption mean? Any of you ever pawned something? And you went to redeem it? What did you do when you redeemed it? Buy it back. You bought it back. Exactly. All right. Uh, is it Elder Jameson? Oh, you you just you just um um gave the great answers from redemption from guilt and power of sin through His blood. But you you made a great point. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So He redeemed us. He redeemed us from 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 sin from the guilt. Of, but how did it, through His blood? His blood brought us back. So when we, when we were not in Christ, we belonged to Satan. You know, Adam sold us to the devil. He literally sold us to the devil. When you're not in, 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 in Christ, you belong, uh, you belong to the devil. And so Christ, through Christ's blood, he redeemed us. He brought us back. He made a way for us to come back to God through his blood and, and through the forgiveness of sins. Um, and why did God do that? Why did he redeem us? It says, according to the riches of his grace. God is rich in grace. I know you want God to be rich in houses and land, but it says he's rich in grace. And then this is where he has abounded. He has, meaning he's lavished this on us, abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. So God is rich in grace. He's rich in mercy. And he has lavished his grace and his mercy upon us. Okay, so redemption and forgiveness uh, are, are, are some of those two of the two more of those spiritual blessings that he has blessed us with. And then it says in nine, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. Now, what is that about the mystery of his will? Someone want to elaborate on that? Not only did he redeem us and forgive us, forgiven us, but
but he made known unto us the mystery of his will. So Paul is talking about a mystery here. Anybody want to elaborate on that? On this mystery? Remember, it talks about, I think it says something about if the principalities had known uh, what God had planned, they would have never crucified, they would have never crucified Christ, they would have never had him put to death. And so God has been working uh, before the foundation of the world, and now what he's doing has been revealed. Why Christ came or what he's doing through Christ has been revealed to us. He's made it known unto us what he's doing. Um, uh, everybody, uh, when you talk to, I've talked to Jehovah Witnesses, I've talked to Muslims, um, and they have an ideal um, of scripture. But Paul is revealing here that God has made known unto her, us the mystery of his will. So we won't be, be deceived. I think, um, Muhammad, when you talk about the Quran, it was given by revelation. Muhammad, an angel gave Muhammad that revelation. I think it was the angel Gabriel. And then like the Book of Mormon, um, I think it was the angel Mori, he came, gave him that revelation. And so um, even the, the um, and so there are different books that people have claimed that they're from God and they have revelations. But Paul is saying, God has made known unto us the mystery of his will. It's in the scripture. We talked about um, 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 uh, we talked about doing the, the doing the resurrection, the seven last sayings. Um, Jesus fulfilled all of the scriptures that were concerning concerning his first coming. All right, he's going to return. There's scriptures about his second coming, but all the scriptures that concern his first coming have been fulfilled. They've been revealed. The mystery of those have been revealed in Christ. Yes, good evening. I'm enjoying you. And, and and praise God. And it also says in the scriptures, it's not his will that any should perish. Isn't, mm -hmm. isn't that what it's referring to as well? But all come to the knowledge of the truth of yeah. in Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he wants us all to come to the knowledge of the truth. And the knowledge of the truth is in scripture. Paul said he made known unto us the mystery of his will. He says that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one, all in one, all in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So he's bringing all things together in Christ, in heaven and that are on earth. Um, he talks about uh, how that uh, um, we read earlier about the Gentiles. That was not known. You know, just the Jews were, were had the opportunity to, to be saved. But Paul said he revealed this mystery that the, even the Gentiles, he told Abraham that in you and, all, and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So this mystery uh, uh, has been revealed that, Christ, that through Christ, God would bring all nations to himself. This was a mystery that was hidden. But Paul said he's made known unto us the mysteries, the mysteries of that had been hidden um, throughout all these ages. God has made known unto us this mystery. Elder Jameson. Yeah, this is um, great, Elder Power. I was just thinking about um, how you were um, asking us about Ephesians 1, 9, having made unto, known unto us. And the us understanding it was all of us who have received the adoption of mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. And this mystery, um, this word mystery kind of puts us in a category where everyone won't receive this. The word mystery here is used. It's in the sense of, let's put it like this, something beyond human comprehension mm -hmm. um, until a certain time revealed. The mystery of his will is revealed and is declared even in Ephesians 1 and 10 according to God's good pleasure. So mm -hmm. it's, it's for the, the people 
who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And uh, it really goes beyond comprehension of what we could even imagine. But to those that have really accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we are in a special um, um, category unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. And he reveals this to us, like you said, you, we have to be led daily um, by his spirit, by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And he'll lead, and lead us into our wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, and truth. Um, so we are in a special um, category that we learn, we seek him, and it says uh, we seek him, and we shall find him. We ask and it shall be given. Yeah. So we have to continuously seek God like we're doing now in Bible study. We're learning, and um, we're, we're after more knowledge, more truth. Mm -hmm. And God will reveal it. So this is great yeah. in-depth teaching. It's deep, but yeah. it's great to know that we have to continue to strive and seek after the Lord. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, and he says that in the dispensation of the fullness of time. So when it was when it was the right time, God revealed this mystery unto us. He said in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. Uh, we've been talking about the end time. So God is going to, he said his plan is to gather all things in heaven and that are on earth in Christ. Um, um, the end times is about God setting up his kingdom. His kingdom has come. Um, we talked about that how all the scriptures concerning his first coming have been fulfilled. And then now the scriptures concerning his second coming um, are, need, are going to be fulfilled. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, he has revealed this in his words so we won't be deceived. Um, his first Elder, coming. Elder Powell. Yes. Let me just read this statement. It says, um, the mystery involves the fulfillment of God's plan to bring everything together in the Messiah. Mm-hmm. So it all comes together in Christ. Christ brings it all. He brings it all together. Um, and we know that Christ, God is going to, Christ is going to set up his throne on earth. Amen. All right. And so, and he will, he will rule uh, on earth. He's going to set up his throne on earth in Jerusalem. And he's going to reign, we will reign on earth, and we will reign, rule and reign with him. Amen. Um, let's get through these next set of verses. Uh, it's getting late. Um, someone read that for me. Starting at verse 11, he talks about three other, one, two, two other uh, spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. So we begin to read in verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, bring, being predestinated according to to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Okay. So he's talking about, uh, he's talking about the Jews who first trusted. Okay. Go ahead. Read verse 13. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Okay, so he says in verse 12 that we, uh, he's talking about we, then in verse 13, he talks about ye, or you, how you came to Christ. Go ahead, read, read, read the next one. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession Unto the praise of his glory. Okay. So he's doing everything that to the praise of his glory that he might be glorified. All right. Verse 11 says, in whom we have obtained an inheritance. Now, what is that about? We, we, you know, we read about the Jews having an inheritance. But he says, in whom we have obtained an inheritance. What is that? What is, what, what is he talking about? 
in whom we have been obtained an inheritance. This is one of the spiritual blessings that he's given us. He's given us an inheritance. Anybody want to elaborate on that? Eternal life. Okay, eternal life is, is, is part of our inheritance. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna live forever. I mean, that's I like the inherit. I I want that inheritance. I like I want to inherit that myself. That's well, a good when, when you um have children, mm -hmm. you leave to them an inheritance, be they your natural children or your adopted children. And um if you look at the previous verses, we were predestined predestined to be in him mm -hmm. making us his children and so by virtue of the fact that we are his children we have an inheritance yes right yeah and it says in whom meaning in christ we have obtained an inheritance so through his death somebody has to die for you to inherit something and through jesus death we have inherited Spiritual blessings. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Mother Ginya talking about eternal life. We have inherited eternal. Just think about that. We've inherited through Jesus Christ eternal life. Eternal life. We will never go out of existence. We will never, uh, uh, we'll never die in the sense that we will go out of existence. We'll lose consciousness. We ha have eternal life. That's a part of of our inheritance. Man, eternal life. Just think about that. Living forever. Living forever and ever and ever without end. Having inherited eternal life. Anybody else want to add something to that? Man, that's a good, that's a good blessing to inherit. Elder uh, Powell, I know that every spirit will live forever. The mm -hmm. spirit never dies. And all you've spoken and taught tonight, which is fantastic, is that God wants us in spirit to be with him. Yes. He sent Jesus to come back for our spirit that Adam gave away. Only the body dies. Only the flesh dies. The spirit does not die. The spirit cannot die. It goes with the Lord to heaven or to Hades. Mm -hmm. So the inheritance that they speak of, I believe, you're the teacher, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of speaking and asking in a question sense. The inheritance is to go to the Father in spirit so that we could be right there up top, sealed with the Holy Spirit because there is just like a pol insurance policy. You get insurance so that you will, you will be covered that's what an insurance policy, it covers you. And, 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 and Jesus was our insurance policy to cover us, that our spirit would be in the Lord mm -hmm. if we choose what God has predestined for us. But it's a choice to pursue, to go to. So I thank you, yeah. and, and and I just wanted to just kind of speak on what spirit, that spirit never dies. Mm -hmm. So God wants to make certain that our spirit is returned back to the sender, which is him. Yeah, yeah. so we, yeah, he, he said, your spirit will never die. And it says, we have inherited, um, Mother Ginya, we have inherited eternal life in Jesus Christ. That's part of our inheritance, eternal life. Is part of our inheritance in Christ. And it says again, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worked all things at the counsel of his will. It's God who has given us these blessings in Christ. God loves you so much 
that he didn't want you to perish. He didn't want you uh, to go to hell, that, 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 that he has given you all these blessings in Christ. He just wants, if you come to Christ, he wants people to come to Christ so they won't be lost. Mother Kenya said, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God does not want us to be lost. And that's why he sent Jesus Christ. And in him, we have inherited eternal life. Uh, he says, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth. We came to him. That's why we need to preach the gospel. Um, what was pastor's message Sunday? Um, it was about, uh, um, you know, about us. Uh, what was the name of his message? It's about, about us, about the harvest. And so people need to hear the gospel so that they can be saved and so that the harvest will come. In whom we trusted after that we heard the word of truth, that is the gospel of our salvation. And that's why we need to preach the gospel because we want others to inherit this eternal life. We want others to inherit these blessings that we have received. It says, in whom also after that ye believe, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Um, now there, there are there are two, there are two workings of the Holy Spirit. There's the work of the Holy Spirit within, and there's the work of the Holy Spirit upon. It's all the work of the Holy Spirit, but He's working in you. He's working in you, and He's working on you. He's working in you to produce righteousness and holiness, and He's working on you to equip you for service. And so, as we go and we um, uh, we go and try to bring in the harvest, as we preach the gospel. You know, he will equip us to do that. And he will equip us also to live that holy and separated life that uh, that, that we was talking about. I, in, in our, our doctrinal statement says, we believe in the sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost, by whose indwelling the Christians are able to live a holy and separated life in this present world. And I'm going to wrap it up. Verse 14 says, which is the, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. He gave us, he sealed us with the Spirit. Now he's talking about the, he talks about the Father who did all this for us. And then Jesus, who shed his blood. And now we're talking about the Holy Spirit who seals us. Um, and so you see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all working together as one to bring about our salvation and our redemption. Uh, any questions? Any comments? I have a comment. Go ahead. I read in my in, in uh, one of my Bibles it says the earnest of our inheritance means that it is the it's the down payment down payment of our inheritance until yeah. the redemption of the purchased possession. So when we when we receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost, that's the down payment of our inheritance. Yeah, yeah, I think. Uh, uh, Elder, was that Elder uh, Jamison? He talked about the guarantee. Was that Elder? Wasn't it Elder just talking about the guarantee? How did you know it, it, we have a guarantee in Christ? Or was that um, um, was that Deacon? Uh, was that Deacon who, who said that? Somebody said whether we have a, you know, we have a have a guarantee. So. Um, so the Holy Spirit is is the is the guarantee. It's the down payment. If any of you ever bought a house, you had to put down earnest money, and it's usually twenty percent. So they want you to put enough money that if you think about backing out, you think about it twice. You have so much money, so much money invested in this deal that you're not even thinking about backing out. You can't back out. And so he's saying the Holy Spirit is to earn us our, our inheritance, that God has so much invested in us. God has so much invested in our salvation that he can't back out the deal, that he has to go through with the deal. With your, with the, he has to complete your salvation. He has to complete it to the end because he has so much, he has too much invested to back out. So his yep. word... Is guaranteed. Elder Powell, and that it, that's if we want him to keep us until the end. Because you can put down earnest money, you can move into a house, but if you don't make the monthly payments after so many months, you're gonna get evicted. So we can't just 
some people believe that once saved, always saved, because we're, you know, the Holy Spirit made the down payment, but but mm -hmm. we still have to do something. We have to work at our soul salvation, fear and trembling every day. It's it's something for us to do. We can't just mm -hmm. be on cruise. Yeah. Yeah, like the Church of God in Christ does not believe, and I think Scripture uh, does not teach once save, always save. Um, uh, many people take that to mean that, you know, I can just live any kind of way I want to because God chose me to be saved. And he chose someone to be saved. And he chose someone to go to hell. Uh, uh, the Scripture was quoted, God does not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Um but this is God. God put up the earnest money. He put up the earnest. So we know that he's going to see it through to the end. And, um, you know, um, I'm, all of us on here, we want to be saved. We, we're, not, we're not trying to give up. We're not trying to go back. We want to see this thing through to the end. Any more comments? Any more questions? I mean, anybody else? All right. Nobody else? I'm going to give it to our um, Bible Band President, Elder Harrington. We thank God for him um, on tonight. Elder Harrington, are you there? Yes, sir. All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, God bless you. Yeah, if, if you'll stop sharing. God bless you, sir. All great right. lesson. Uh, great, great lesson on, on the book of Ephesians. And we are challenged to, uh, as... Um, Sister Harriet was saying and everything that that we have to work on this life and work on this walk on a daily basis and that God has sent his son, uh, died on the cross, came back. Now it gives us in Acts the, the Holy Ghost, which is the seal, and we are sealed to the day of redemption. But in between that point, those two points are of you being saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and and we have to walk out our soul salvation. We have to pray. I thought something you said was very interesting that those three points about we uh, have to, um, uh, the three disciplines, fasting, uh, prayer, and renewing our minds with the word of God on a daily basis and everything. And that's the work that Sister Harriet, I believe, I'm not speaking for her, but I believe that's what she was saying. That's the work that has to be done. Um, fasting uh, again sometimes not so much from food uh, that is a type of fast but there is a fasting from the things that get your attention away from uh, away from God's presence in your life and uh, we have to be able to deny our flesh and to deny ourselves so that we can be more like him and be a witness be a witness be a witness in the earth amen so we thank God for tonight's lesson. Uh, are there any announcements? No announcements? I don't have an announcement. I do have a prayer request. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'll be traveling this weekend to Savannah to see my brother, um, asking for traveling, uh, prayers for traveling mercy. And um, continue prayer for his healing and uh, whatever the whatever interventions the doctors need to provide for his healing. Amen. God bless you. We'll be praying for you. Is there another? That all the prayer requests. Amen. We thank God. Uh, Mother Ginyard, are you still on the line? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Can you, uh, if there's nothing else, uh, let Mother Ginya close us out in prayer? Yes, sir. Is that all the prayer requests? And Sister Ginya, I, I, I know you'll pray for all of us, so go ahead and pray us out. Thank yes, you. Sir. Praise God. Righteous Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this time of, of Bible study. We thank you for our, our teacher on this evening. We thank you for the wisdom and knowledge you have given him and to others also. But we thank you, Lord, for, for, for the, the, the highly uh, talented persons that you have, have placed here in our church that are able to bring forth the word of God, 
with fear and trembling and, and with anointing and purpose and, and who, have, who are skilled in the word. We thank you, Lord, for everyone that's on the line. We're asking you to be with us on this evening, Lord. Go with us and, and give us peace and knowledge. Open up, continue to open our understanding to your word because we love you, Lord, and we want to be more like you. We, 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 we search daily and we want to be more and more like you. We want to grow in you in the name of Jesus. We ask you to look on our pastor as he uh, 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 takes a trip abroad. Protect him, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Cover him with your blood and bring him back safely at the appointed time and look on his family. If they're here, still here, uh, bless and keep them, Mother Harper. Keep her in good health and strength in the name of Jesus. And look on Sister Bridget. Give her her heart's desire, Lord. We thank you for our, our first family. And look on the, the rest of the first family, his son and, and the nieces, nephews, and cousins and sisters in the name of Jesus. Look on our church family, all that are here under the sound of my voice. Bless and keep us, Lord. Keep us, keep us from from sickness and diseases. If, if there are any are sick amongst us, Lord, we're asking you to bless and keep them. Heal our bodies, Lord. Keep us in perfect peace in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the healing you have already given us. We thank you for the testimonies of healing. We thank you for how you shower down on us daily. Thank you for your anointing in our services. Thank you for our anointed choir. Thank you for all of the leaders. And thank you for Elder Harrington. Remember him, Lord, on this evening. Bless and keep him and his wife. Give them the desires of their heart in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the ministry here at our church. And as we attempt to go on this evening, continue to bless and keep us, Lord. Bless our families in the name of Jesus. Save our loved ones in the name of Jesus and fill them with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. We ask these blessings in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good night, everyone. Right. Good night, everyone. Good lesson, Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Wonderful. Great lesson, Elder Paul. Good night. 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 Good night.